So at this point, we have gaveled in uh, the annual meeting of this movement uh, that we're all a part of here. Uh, if we were all Methodists, uh, we might start out by singing the gathering uh, hymn uh, that starts, And Are We Yet Alive? and See Each Other's Face. Uh, we're not all Methodists uh, here, unfortunately, uh, but we, we, we do come here with, uh, with a, a lot of common aims. Uh, we're here because uh, we're fond of folding chairs and we're fond of dust. Uh, we, uh, we like to listen to the creaking of the barn uh, in the wind uh, as the talks go on. Uh, we are really excited about Kearns of Pancakes here. Uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Amy Halloran, who you're about to hear from, told me the other day that pancakes are her national anthem. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we come here uh, to find a place that melds together art, music, logic, rhetoric, sustainability theory, agricultural praxis, and we're probably here because at some point Wes Jackson has tugged at our heartstrings uh, a little bit. But we didn't all come here exactly the same. Uh, some of us stepped away from a desk to be here. Uh, some of us stepped away from a tractor. Uh, some of us are here from the Great Plains, uh, some from the Corn Belt, from the East Coast, the West Coast, uh, from the South, uh, from different continents uh, entirely. Some of us are here from the largest city in the U.S. Uh, some of us don't have any neighbors within five miles of us uh, where we live and the whole spectrum uh, of population density in between. And I want you at this point to close your eyes and imagine uh, a vision of sustainable agriculture. Uh, what does it look like to you? And of course, what you're picturing is probably not exactly the same as what your neighbor uh, is picturing. And that's a good thing. That's a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of visions. Uh, we have uh, uh, the very good fortune uh, of having that broad diversity and of having uh, two distinct uh, traditions uh, or, or vision families uh, represented in the room here. Uh, both of these are vibrant and both of them are essential as we make our way uh, in the future. Uh, one of them is fundamentally uh, a rurally founded vision, what we commonly call agrarianism. Uh, another one was born in urban areas uh, or, or in the context of urban areas, takes the form of the urban agriculture movement uh, the ur and the urban end as well of the local foods movement. We do a good job, I think, a lot of the time of attending each other's conferences uh, among these two visions, uh, reading each other's books. Um, but I, I think uh, we, we have a little work to do, I get the sense, uh, at putting our ideas in real conversation uh, with one another. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what we're about here uh, these next two days. Now, when you closed your eyes uh, and, and imagined uh, sustainable agriculture, I'm guessing a lot of the rural folks here uh, were thinking of, uh, of field crops, maybe a three or four crop extended rotation. Uh, if you're really on the ball, you were thinking of perennial grain polycultures. Uh, you uh, probably had ruminants uh, out on pasture on this farm. Uh, I'll bet that you were making most of your money from your actual farm operations and, and not from subsidy programs. Um, but, uh, but I wonder how many acres uh, this farm was. I'm, I'm sure that it was a lot fewer than your conventional neighbors in this vision. But land is expensive, uh, e even on a, a lower number of acres. And, and I wonder in this vision, how easy is it for young people uh, to get into agriculture? Is it even possible at all for economically disadvantaged people, uh, even, even at the scale that, that, that I myself uh, imagine in this vision? Um, in the vision, are there uh, customers in the picture? If there were, uh, what's your accountability to them? Uh, what's your connection to them? Not in an abstract sense, but, but in a real sense. Now, uh, urban folks, uh, uh, in the vision that you had, uh, you were thinking of urban farming systems, no doubt, uh, that were making the cities you live in vibrant. They're providing uh, healthy, high-quality food, uh, maybe in a food desert, uh, revitalizing neighborhoods, uh, connecting farmers and consumers, old people and young people. 
but I want to ask uh, that, uh, that even after uh, all the vegetables uh, that you produced are, are consumed, even at the rate that we're supposed to be eating vegetables, um, you, know, you know, double check, was your diet most likely still based uh, on staple crops like whole grains, uh, healthy oils, vegetable proteins, maybe animal proteins? And where did those staples come from? How did they flow to the city? Uh, how were they produced where they came from? Uh, were those practices sustainable for the production that was going on in this urban ag vision? Um, I'm sure you're doing a good job recycling soil fertility, but where did it come from initially? All the compost uh, that you might be using, where did that come from? Uh, both of these visions, urban and rural, are beautiful visions, uh, necessary visions. Um, but we, we have uh, be these beautiful visions that are sweeping in scope, uh, usually relative to the physical and mental setting that we inhabit. Um, but sweeping visions uh, often turn up uh, to be somewhat incomplete when we widen our boundaries of consideration uh, to include uh, all the biophysical processes that, that govern uh, the planet that we live on, all the cultural and, and economic processes uh, that govern our society. Uh, and incomplete visions uh, uh, lead to, to risky decisions. Uh, at, at this point, I think we're aware that we're losing the luxury of making many more risky decisions. And we have 410 parts per million atmospheric CO2 Globally, uh, we're losing 13 tons an acre a year of soil still. In the U.S., we have 700 out of every 100,000 people incarcerated. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, to put it as, as W.H. Auden famously put it, we must love each other or die relative to assembling these visions. Now, for my part, I come from a very rural part of uh, west central Illinois. In Illinois, uh, we're a state uh, that has a primate city, which is an old uh, geography term that refers to a city that's unrivaled in population and economic activity uh, relative to the district uh, that it's in. And to be an Illinoisan, at least in recent generations, uh, is to be uh, uh, bathed in cultural tensions uh, in the media and in life between Chicago and between downstate Illinois. Uh, we often generalize these tensions into cutting statements of various kinds about uh, the demerits of, of urban or the demerits of rural. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I want to put this in a little context here. Um, many of you uh, remember me last year talking about my Stevenson and Lambert great-grandparents, uh, who at the beginning of the 20th century were already the third and fourth generations of their families to farm in western Illinois and how uh, at that point even they practiced what today we would call ecologically based crop and livestock management. They grew grain, they grew hay, and they marketed it on the hoof. Uh, they retained most of the carbon and nutrients on the farm in the soil in that manner. Now at that time in the aughts and the teens and the twenties, uh, marketing livestock meant marketing them to the city. Uh, where the, the livestock receiving and slaughter and packing infrastructure was located. Um, marketing at that time, uh, marketing livestock meant, meant marketing them by rail. Uh, and for farmers, uh, marketing livestock often meant getting on the train and accompanying the shipment of livestock to the destination to complete the transaction. And so it was that rural people uh, like uh, Dana Stevenson and Millard Lambert, my great-grandfather's, uh, were uh, rural people who had a frequent presence in urban places uh, like uh, the Union Stockyards uh, in downtown Chicago where they were selling cattle and hogs. Now as a, a multi-generational country boy, I naturally married a city girl. Uh, some of you have met my wife, uh, Melissa Cavillo, uh, who grew up uh, in Chicago, uh, city of Chicago proper, although I often like to point out uh, that she grew up just a few blocks away uh, from the last uh, commercial field crop and livestock farm in the city of Chicago, where that, that once was. Um, but I want to talk about Melissa's great-grandfather uh, for a minute here. Uh, Joseph Cavillo uh, was born as Jose Cavillo in uh, Salao, Mexico in 1892, and he emigrated to the U.S. in about 1916. Uh, he and his wife, Mary, made their way through Texas uh, to Chicago, uh, went on to raise 11 children, 
many of whom are actually still gathering in, uh, in the park in, in a particular suburb uh, for an annual menudo and hot dog picnic. Uh, I've made it there, uh, I'm glad to say, and it's, uh, it's quite a deal. Uh, Joseph Cavillo was a, a track laborer for the Rock Island Railroad, and as nearly as we can tell, he spent uh, the bulk of his, his working time uh, maintaining tracks uh, uh, in the vicinity of the Union stockyards. And so that's how it was that some 70 years before Melissa and I met, uh, Millard Lambert and Joseph Cavillo spent a fair amount of time on the job uh, within about a mile of each other. Now we have no reason to think that our great grandfathers ever met, and even if they did, uh, Millard Lambert uh, spoke no Spanish, uh, Joseph Cavillo spoke little English, um, but I feel confident uh, that the economic interdependence that they had was at some level obvious to them at the time. The interdependence their families had, their neighbors, their neighbors' neighbors. No farm products, no railroad. No railroad, no agriculture, at least of the, the kind of agriculture that was practiced. No food, no city. No city, no market for food. In 2017, we may do a better job of being intentional, reflecting on these interdependences, but I think we have a long way to go before that realization of interdependence is woven thoroughly into our, our lives in the way that it was in a previous era. So in Chicago, the uh, Union Stockyards in the 1920s was a crossroads setting. It was a junction of multiple paths uh, that people trod to carry out practical matters of human existence. And what I wonder now, as Melissa and I are raising the great-great-grandchildren of Millard Lambert and Joseph Cavillo, uh, children of city and country, uh, descendants of Lancashire and, and Guanajuato, uh, what I wonder uh, is if there's a lesson in some of this past history. Now, I don't think the lesson is to rebuild uh, the Union stockyards or the downtown slaughterhouse complexes, uh, which after all are what inspired Upton Sinclair to write The Jungle. Um, but we need to find our own crossroads, is what I'm suggesting, where urban and rural people can meet as they go about their business and feel tangibly connected to one another, uh, to understand that we're all engaged in the same basic human endeavor of growing and harvesting and cooking and eating. Um, so these crossroads, uh, these crossroads of common activity, common usefulness, and common understanding uh, sometimes will be literal, many other times they'll be figurative, but one way or another we need to find our crossroads here. Uh, and, and so we're embarking on this conversation here uh, about uh, urban and rural and how we cast a perennial vision uh, for the future. Mm -hmm.